Hello, uh, I am John, sometimes known as John the Nice Guy, and this is my first shot at doing uh, Twitch. So, um, you've probably never seen me before. Uh, I am a um, professional computer um, person. Uh, my day job is working for a large, what they call a solutions integrator. Um, and my day job is basically um, making stuff work on the internet. Uh, predominantly focusing on um, network security products and stuff like that, um, but um, yeah, I, I work in IT. Um, in the evenings, I sometimes try and experiment a bit with um, Ansible and Terraform and stuff like that. And one of the things that I have been doing recently is um, <coughs> uh, doing some work with um, a group called log.org.uk. Uh, and log.org.uk is uh, the people that host resources for people that run Linux user groups in the UK. Um, I've been involved with them for probably about six or seven years, um, mostly just yeah, keeping stuff ticking over. Nothing serious, nothing critical. This is just experiments and you know creating user accounts, keeping software patched and stuff like that. Um, one of the things that, because my day job uh, involves a lot of automation and orchestration, as I said, working with Ansible and things like that. Uh, I wanted to start doing some stuff around uh, that Ansible side of things um, with uh, Log.org.uk. Uh, and one of the things that I started doing that with uh, was actually looking at their um, the DNS services that Log.org.uk provide. So, um, I have uh, created an Ansible playbook to uh, deploy um, the DNS records, all of the DNS records that log.org.uk uses. Um, and there's nothing private or secret or confidential in this stuff. Um, what might happen a bit later on is I might have to uh, just put some SSH keys and stuff in like that in to get onto the box uh, and do some management of the kit there. Um, the environment you're looking at at the moment is um, my machine. Uh, now, I've mentioned I'm involved with Linux user groups, um, but um, this machine that I'm currently working on um, actually uh, is a tablet. It's a tablet computer, uh, and for fair means or foul, at the moment I cannot make the tablet stuff work with um, with this tablet. So the um, Ubuntu GNOME. Uh, KD Plasma, uh, Ubuntu Mate, none of those are working the way I want to on this tablet. And because of the fact that this is um, this is an experiment for me, um, I figured I'd go back to using Windows uh, for my personal stuff. Now, with work, I use um, Windows all the time, uh, and typically actually in this same configuration here. So uh, it's usually running the Windows subsystem for Linux using Ubuntu. Uh, and uh, I've quite often got this Visual Studio Code editor open. If you've not come across VS Code before, um, it's very nice, it's very shiny, does lots of extension things. Um, but what do I want to do? Well, the first thing that I actually need to do uh, is actually crack open um, the environment I'm working in. So. Uh, What's it just done? That's a good start, isn't it? Have I just completely crashed VS Code? Ah, there we go. I crashed the remote session to Windows Subsystem. That's good. Um, whilst this is starting up, um, I have got some links uh, at the bottom down here, somewhere over that way. Anyway, I can't figure out where the mouse is, where the um, webcam points towards everything else. Uh, so um, there is my blog there, um, john.sprig.js. Uh, and um, if you find some of the stuff I'm talking about in this uh, of interest to you, um, there is a buy me a coffee link there. Not obliged to. You don't definitely don't have to. If you want to, though, 
be really generous of you and it definitely uh, makes me spending some time on this stuff um, more feasible to explain away to my wife. Uh, so, oh, that's what it's done. It's opened up my home directory. That's not what I wanted. Never mind. Let me bring up the terminal. Um, okay, so what I actually want to do is uh, link um, my project directory. So, now I want to see users, John's Briggs, documents, um, projects into this directory. Um, so in projects, I have got blah, 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 here we go, 2020, 11, 23. Uh, so this is, I know, a crazy directory structure, um, which is to have um, uh, your projects with the date at the beginning. It just gives me a way of having some sort of idea as to when I started in something. It's uh, something I got into doing. With work, but you know, whatever. So I'm in my project directory, <clears throat> um, and in here I have a vagrant file. Uh, and if you haven't had a look at vagrant before, um, that's a good point. I need to reopen this because I'm opening in the wrong directory here. Open folder. Um, yes, if you've not had a look at Vagrant before, it's a really, really helpful piece of um, software. Uh, and effectively, what it does is um, it lets you start up virtual machines uh, and it lets you run those virtual machines locally. Um, now, it has been a while since I have looked at um, how I've got this lot all set up. Bum, bum, bum. Lightning fast issue with the VSL, um, yeah, VSL, WSL um, is obviously the opening files and stuff is uh, is a bit tricky. Uh, right, so let's open up this vagrant file. So, what is a vagrant file? So a vagrant file is a way of defining a virtual machine. Uh, if you've looked at anything like Terraform or stuff like that, um, it's kind of similar to that. So you've got a configuration up here where it says you know VM dot box equals some stuff, how long it's going to take to boot that machine up, uh, and if you set that to zero, it doesn't time that out, it's saying don't check for updates to that box, because it just moans at you, um, and then how much space do you want to, how much memory do you want to give that box. So I am defining a single virtual machine here, I think, this is right, yes, this is my <coughs> um, This is my uh, admin machine. So log.org.uk has got five machines. Five machines, six machines, something like that. Um, the first one is admin, and admin is where all DNS services live. Uh, so um, the DNS service is hosted there, uh, and there's very little else on that box. Uh, historically, it used to hold those things like uh, monitoring services and uh, yeah, I think that might have been it actually. Uh, so um, log.org.uk kind of grew organically. It started off as being um, a VE, uh, a virtual machine, uh, a co-located machine in the data center, um, and then it had uh, a handful of virtualized machines sitting on top of it. So we were constrained by you know, what services we could run by how much infrastructure we had there. Um, about 10, maybe a little bit longer ago, years than that, um, Love.org.uk um, was offered, sponsored uh, hosting by uh, fine, fine providers of VPS is uh, a bit folk from memory, 
uh, yeah, Bitfolk. Uh, and Bitfolk basically have given log.org.uk um, virtual machines um, for uh, any services we ask them for, ultimately. I think if we were to ask them, you know, can we have a thread ripper or something like that, we might get in trouble. But, um, you know, for, for the bulk of what we're looking to do, um, we can pretty much get away with asking for anything. Um, but, so the first box is called admin. Uh, there are some other boxes as well. Um, Web01, um, mail in 01, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I'll get to that properly in a bit. Um, but initially, um, this is our admin machine. So what I'm going to do is because I am running Windows subsystem for Linux um, and I uh, have got VirtualBox installed. So uh, uh, Vagrant is a tool that orchestrates lots of different hypervisors but the one that you most typically see is uh, VirtualBox uh, and as a result most of the virtual machine um, images uh, are built for VirtualBox. Uh, so this is a, a virtual box, virtual machine. So I'm going to use uh, uh, vagrant.exe. That's basically saying, don't look for this in the Windows side of the, in the Linux side of things. Look for this in the Windows side of things. Uh, so hmm. maybe not. Uh, one moment, caller, whilst I just very briefly check in in a separate window, hopefully. And there we go. Uh, Why not install Vagrant yet? Oh, well, it's a perfect opportunity then. Uh, I will install Vagrant on this machine. Vagrant.com. Okay. So, let me pop this down here. Possibly. Nope. Oh, it's just detached the window up there, typically. Um, okay, so. Now, I'm getting this from vagrantup.com. Uh, and let's go down there. I'm downloading the Windows version. Have I got VirtualBox installed? Let me just check our screen. Oh, goodness me, I've not got VirtualBox installed yet either. Okay, that's going to take a little longer than I was hoping to do. Never mind. Okay, VirtualBox. Oh, this was purchased like, um, after the, the death of my poor beloved previous, uh, which, if you have ever seen me talk at conferences and the like, uh, you would have seen me toting it. Uh, this is a brand new machine. Uh, it's a Fujitsu um, Stylistic V727 uh, tablet, um, which is very nice. Uh, so, download the virtual box platform package. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, we can execute that one now. We can execute that one now. Ah, timer. Fantastic. Okay. So we got this one. Don't think we need that anymore. Uh, 
pum pum pum. Let's do this to the short pan. I don't stick the net quick launch bar. Next, yes. Install. This may cut me off from the network for a second. That's fun. The stream might drop for a moment. But seeing as I have nobody in the chat at the moment, I don't know that's a problem. Well, this is riveting TV, isn't it? Um, okay, whilst that's uh, whilst that's running, I'm going to save this and then just walk you through what this vagrant file is doing. So yeah, so as I mentioned, this box file here, um, that is telling you which image to get. And there's a whole host of images. Let me just pop back down here. The list of boxes, so you can have a quick look at that one. Uh, so... Uh, Correct, vagrant up. And does this tell you where to get the boxes from? Ah, find boxes. So one of the things that I have done in the past is I used to be involved in another project called Vagrant Boxes, uh, which is Vagrant Box. Boxes. Uh, and this uh, pretty much used to do all of the stuff that um, the Discover Vagrant Boxes thing was. Uh, whilst it still exists, um, it's quite old now. And a lot of the boxes, I'm sure, are now dead. But uh, we'll get back to that. So yes, there's loads and loads of boxes in here that you can get. Um, and you can filter by which hypervisor platform you want. Uh, you can do stuff like... Uh, have provider of um, AWS or DigitalOcean stuff like that, but as I said, most people tend to package for just VirtualBox. Um, as you can see, the most common package is uh, Trusty, which is the 1404 LTS build. Um, there's the 1604 LTS build of Ubuntu. Debbie and Jesse, not too far after that. Um, I will typically tend to use um, Ubuntu uh, Focal, which is the most recent um, image, um, or the most recent Debian uh, image, which in this case is Buster. So Buster 64 is the most recent one, or at least I believe it is anyway. Um, still setting up. Oh. Um, so after these two lines, which tell you, uh, this is how you boot the box. This one says don't check for updates for that box file. And that's because um, what most of the box packages tend to do is they'll release a new image every few days. Um, and it's not got anything significant changed in it aside from the default password. Because these things ship with a default password. The last thing you really want is default password. So um, because they have to ship a box with a password, what they do is they ship a box with a uh, random password and what they call an insecure key. The insecure key is then um, uh, shipped as part of that box. Just uh, click through on that window there, wherever it's gone. There we go. Come back. Ah, you're all the way up there. Why are you all the way up there? That's very foolish. Don't start virtual. Because the next thing we need to do is pop back up uh, this so we can run the Vagrant install. Yes, okay. Okay. Ah, that's one. Okay. Um, yeah, so. Um, they're basically just bundling it to get a new password out every time, which isn't a big problem, but it's just something to be aware of. Um, so, uh, the default image size for these VirtualBox images can be anything from, you know, uh, 
500 meg to a gig um, uh, because of the fact that I'm trying to at least loosely mirror, mirror real life um, I'm sticking to gig in there now this may hit a slight problem with what I'm building here because um, this machine actually only has 8 gig of RAM in it and it's not upgradable either um, so I might struggle with this one if I do struggle with this what I'll end up doing in one of my next sessions is probably running something up in uh, AWS or Azure beforehand so we've got the box there uh, ready at the very least to uh, show you something. Uh, so what does it do next? Right. Uh, so this bit here lets me SSH in as admin. Um, so by default there's a user called Vagrant in most of these Vagrant boxes um, and the Vagrant user, I'm going to stick that up there so I can keep a track on it whilst it's running, um, the Vagrant user um, basically just has um, it's just your standard user account uh, what I want to do though is be able to SSH in to not just the normal user but into the root account so I'm copying the SSH keys uh, from the Vagrant user to the root user and the reason why I can do this is because actually when you run this config VM provision thing here you're actually running it as root uh, so I then say inline if um, this file here exists. Don't do anything because that not means do not do not do anything. So if this file exists, then uh, if it doesn't exist, rather make this directory, copy this file, uh, set the read only, the read and write permissions for the root user only, or for the user uh, to this file. Set the read write and execute to this directory, and then set the permissions of the owner to the root. Now. If you're not comfortable with uh, Linux file system conventions, um, there are three permissions that you can assign to any file. Read, write, and execute. Uh, so when it comes to a file, uh, read and write um, literally mean, can you read that file? Can you write that file? Um, and execute means, can you run it? Uh, so in the top line of quite a lot of um, scripts you'll see like a you'll see a line that looks like hash bang and then bin bash or you might see um, user local env python or something like that. yeah what that basically says is <clears throat> um, the shell interpreter looks at that line and works out which command it is you want to want it to run uh, so you might say uh, run you know um, uh, bash, which is the shell interpreter for, for Linux. It might say run the um, Python editor, um, editor interpreter. Um, I can't even remember. I was going with that one. Now. Anyway, so so what this does is it copies this script to the server and then executes it. Fantastic. Um, the next thing we are doing is we are so this runs on all of the virtual machines that we're going to create and that's because it's prefixed with config uh, the next thing we say is we're going to say define a new machine which we're going to call admin uh, and this bit here says so you can call this bit wherever you want so you can call that Fred if you wanted or Bob or whatever um, and this part here says do to this object we're creating anything that's prefixed this. So, whereas these all say config dot, this says admin dot because it's this line here. So admin dot vm hostname. So we're going to set the hostname for this machine to being admin dot log dot uk. And then it says uh, admin dot vm dot network private network and then IP address. So two things to mention here. By default, every Vagrant box comes up with a single network interface, which is a NAT interface. What does that mean? Um, so it's designed for you to be able to SSH into it, or RDP if you're running a Windows box. Uh, so you SSH into that virtual machine, um, and you can make requests out. But that's because you're on your local machine. And so what they do is they, they do port forward. So when you run Vagrant up, it will assign a port 
TCP 2222 uh, to the um, SSH service that's running on the machine, which is fine, aside from the fact that I want to be able to do things from outside the virtual machine that are not on that fixed port. Um, so I've got this thing here called a private network. So when I look in my network, and then tell it to go to adapters. In here you now see that there is um, some Ethernet network interfaces and a virtual box host only network. So this is a private network. Um, and so this line here says, if you need to stand up a new private network, stand up a new private network and stick this IP address on the virtual machine and then assign yourself, your local machine, another IP address in that network. Um, so what this means is that I can address this address here, 192.0.2 something, uh, now, why have I picked 192.0.2.0 slash 24? Um, that's because that's what they call a, an example network. Uh, so it's actually in what they call the RFCs, uh, request for comments. And RFCs are basically how a lot of the internet has been developed. Um, so I tend to use these RFC, um, uh, RFC uh, 5737. So if you want to go and have a look for RFC 5737, you can do. <coughs> um, but so RFC 5737 defines three slash 24, that's 255 network address um, subnets um, for the purposes of um, documentation, testing, things like that. Um, and the most common one that I remember, or the most usual one, is 192.0.2.0 slash 24. The other two are 198.51.100.0 slash 24 and 203.0.113.0 slash 24. So those are three 24-bit networks. Um, there are some others that you can use. Um, RFC 2544 gives you 198.18 slash 15. So that's 198.18.0.0 through all the way through to 198.19.255.255. If you were ever to be using that much network, that would be kind of crazy. And that's actually designed to use for uh, internet inter-networking testing. So to test between one routed subnet and another routed subnet. But as a result, it's documentation address space. So you can use that one because it's not going to conflict with anything. It's, it's what they call a non-routable address. Um, so if your ISP or your cloud hosting provider sees those network blocks, they are required not to forward them on um, to anything outside the network. So that's, yeah, it's good for labs, good, good for stuff like this. If you have the um, capability of standing up uh, a lab network in something like AWS or Azure, you can stick these addresses on there. If you've got um, an employer that's willing to spend for physical tin, um, then you can stick these addresses on all the boxes you use there. So that's that part. Um, the next thing here is this line here. Uh, ask VirtualBox um, to name this machine admin. So when I actually run VirtualBox, which I will do in a bit, um, you will see that the, the virtual machine it creates from this box file up here uh, will be called admin. So initially it will be called something like um, uh, 2020.11.23 admin log dog dk bind blah 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 um, uh, underscore default underscore then a hash. Uh, when I say hash I mean uh, a, a hex, a long hex number. I call that hash, it's not the right name for it, but it's just my way of remembering it. And that's because when you do something like an MD5 sum or a SHA256 sum, uh, these are hashing algorithms that you can run as an executable. <clears throat> they generate blobs of hexadecimal numbers. So that's why I call it a hash. It's not the right word for it, but it works. Um, so 
here we run another provision command. So this provision command here runs on all of the virtual machines we create. And then this one here runs on any new um, any time we stand up this Ansible, this uh, this admin machine. Uh, and this is going to do quite a few different bits and pieces. So uh, it's going to look and see whether or not Ansible's been installed yet, because sometimes it can be. Uh, and if it's not installed, uh, then we're going to check and see if pip3, which is the Python packaging tool, exists. And if pip3 exists, or if pip3 doesn't exist, then we apt update apt install pip3 um, and curl, because we need curl for stuff later on. Uh, and then, um, so this means we've installed pip. Then um, if this file here, Vagrant Ansible requirements, exists, then pip3 install upgrade from that file. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, otherwise, just install Ansible. So this is designed to be a boilerplate uh, script. And essentially, it's there just so that I can uh, spin up a handful of bits and pieces. Um, uh, but this specific part here, so. Um, this path does not typically exist on virtual machines. Um, one of the special things that Vagrant does is it creates a mount between the directory that uh, Vagrant is run from and this path slash Vagrant on the virtual machine. So anything that's in here, Ansible, Vagrant file, source, blah, 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 they all will appear under this Vagrant path, which is great. So let's have a quick look in. Actually, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so <clears throat> uh, by default, it's going to install Ansible <coughs> unless requirements exist, in which case we can come back and pull that one out. And then it says Ansible. Uh, and this is a little bit of bash trickery. Uh, so what this says is <coughs> um, pip freeze. Uh, and what pip freeze does is it lists off all of the packages that are installed in the Python pip environment. Um, any errors, stick them to null. Uh, well, stick the output to null to the output for those errors to null. And then run this command grep. So grep is a regular expressions parser. Uh, and effectively, what we're saying is if you see this string, Ansible equals inside the output of this command, then tell me it. Fab. If pip doesn't exist, so this, if this returns an error, it's going to try running pip3, pip freeze, pip3 freeze rather instead. This is basically this command or this command. Um, and then stick the output from that to dev null, and then again, look for Ansible, fab. So then this next bit here uses the cut command. And the cut command basically splits blocks of text depending on what this delimiter here is. So this delimiter is an equals. So what happens when you run pip? Uh, pip3, so I've got pip installed on here yet? No, of course you don't. Um, so let me show you this uh, requirements file then, see if that's got anything in there. Is that it? Yes, so um, when you do pip freeze, it shows it in this kind of format here. So it goes ansible equals equals and then the version number. And the reason why it lists it out like that is because what you're supposed to do is then cut from pip freeze and paste it into this requirements file. So everyone that's working on your project gets the same software release. Fab. Okay, so this is basically saying look at the output from pip freeze and then cut the result for where we say Ansible at the equal signs. So again, let me show you that requirements file again. So at the at the equal sign, so there's our first one, our first field. Null space between that equal sign, that equal sign, second one, and the third one is there. So it's saying, so when I run this, what I should get 
is an Ansible version of 10.2.10.3. Um, and it also means if I then later update this, so it says 2.10.4 or uh, 2.7. whatever, then this means that this Ansible version here will always be the same. Fab. <clears throat> so, um, bum, 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 bum. We don't need that bit. Um, there is a file called ansible.cfg. Um, <clears throat> and ansible.cfg is the default configuration file for all instances of the running Ansible. Uh, and Ansible <clears throat> has got some default settings in it, which I will overload later with the stuff that's in this playbook. But again, this is boilerplate. <clears throat> so what this is saying is, um, if this file doesn't exist, I want you to get it from the GitHub Ansible project in the directory, this Ansible version. Um, and there's a file in there called slash examples slash ansible.cfg. And I want that to go out to etc. Ansible, ansible.cfg. Fantastic. <coughs> Once I've got that in there, I'm then going to set chmod, uh, which is um, change permissions. Uh, and again, I'm setting this to read, so read and write for the user, read only, sorry, read only for the group. Uh, and again, this is because Linux has got these uh, three permission states. So read, write, execute, uh, and they are applied against um, the user, so the, the owner of the file, um, the primary group, or any group that that the user is a member of, uh, and then everyone. So what this is saying is that anyone can read, member of the uh, owner of that file, uh, which will be root probably, um, uh, can. Uh, read it, uh, but the root user can read and write that file. Fab. These two lines here are to do fun stuff with SSH, which we don't need to worry about right now because we're not going to be SSHing to anywhere from this at the moment. Um, and then this block here builds up the inventory. So what is inventory? <clears throat> uh, so the inventory is a either a static list of hosts. Uh, so you might have, um, you know, 56 DNS resolvable machine names. Fantastic, just a list of hosts. You can also assign groups to these, this list of, this list of hosts. Um, so you can say things like um, uh, uh, web servers uh, are prefixed web, star or wb uh, and then a number between one and 500 however it is you cut your machine names and you can assign variables to those hosts or to those groups um, you can add groups to other groups and things like that there's lots of stuff you can do with ansible host this is a very simple inventory file and this literally just says this one machine has an ansible connection type of local so what this means is that any time that I refer in my Ansible script to admin, what I mean is make a local connection to this machine. And you can do things like say Ansible username equals, you know, some user. Um, so particularly, so Ansible is designed to commit, uh, make connections over SSH. So you might say um, uh, Ansible connection equals SSH um, S and your SSH to, um, you know, my ho my dot host dot example or, or something like that. If you're doing an SSH connection like that, what you need to provide is a username, because otherwise it'll connect as your user, uh, which might not be a problem, but you might have a specific user account you want to connect to, like admin or root or something like that. Um, you can provide a password, or it'll use the SSH keys that you've got in your machine. Uh, there are other connection types as well. So if you're connecting to a Windows machine, uh, you can use WinRM. Um, if you are connecting to network switches and routers, you can use HTTP API. There's lots of different ways of cutting connection strings. Uh, but the upshot of this is that the admin account is going to be local to that machine. Again, this is boilerplate really for me because I'm used to kind of putting bits and pieces of cogs together. Um, this last bit is a bit of a hack. Um, uh, 
I use a tool called BindFS. BindFS works on uh, any Linux machine uh, except for Windows Subsystem for Linux. And effectively what it does is it remounts a part of your file system um, into somewhere else in your file system. And the reason why this is really useful, particularly with Vagrant, is because the Vagrant um, file mount that is created has a set of permissions on it, um, which is read, write, execute for everything, uh, for all users, uh, which is great for basic development work. I'm working on my machine, uh, stuff doesn't work. I just want to be able to read and write it if I've got access to it from the root, uh, from the parent file system. It's not so good if you are trying to use things like SSH keys or um, you're trying to simulate an environment where you've got more restrictive permissions in play. Uh, so uh, I'm using bindfs uh, and I'm going to add an, a, lab to, uh, a line to the fs tab. An fs tab is the file system table that when the machine boots it reads from. Uh, so I'm going to be sticking um, this line here, slash vagrant slash ansible, which as I said before, vagrant is pointing to this directory here, so here's the ansible directory. Mount that into etc ansible install and use the fuse bindfs file system and then apply these permissions to it. I'm not going to go into what those mean, but basically it means that the user, that the um, owner of that file uh, is the, either the vagrant or the root user, um, <coughs> depending on who's trying to access it. Um, and the permissions that are assigned to it are 0640, which is um, the O at the beginning is a special digit, but you have to put it in there for reasons. Um, but then, so it's 640. So I'm basically saying that uh, the owner can read and write it, the group can read only it, and the anyone else cannot access it at all. And this bit here is saying that the user and the group also add the uh, uh, execute permissions directories. So this line here basically is the line I want to stick into my FS tab. Uh, so I'm then saying if that file, if that line doesn't exist in that file, um, then we're going to echo it in. Uh, to SHFS tab. Now, technically, what I could do at this point is actually reuse a technique I've got up here somewhere. Where's that technique I had? Here we go. This Ansible localhost line in file thing. So I could technically do that, uh, but for some reason, when I was writing this, I decided not to bother doing that for this. It must have been a reason. <clears throat> um, if I have, oh, I know why. <clears throat> If that line <coughs> doesn't exist in there, um, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmount etc. Ansible if it already exists. <coughs> I'm then going to check, I'm going to remove that line from in there. Oh, so if that line was in there. <laughs> okay, that's a bit random. If that line Oh, if I've made a typo, ultimately, um put that line back in there. I don't know why that's there, but it is. Okay, random. And then finally I'm going to tell it to mount everything that's in that FS tab file. So on the whole, this is not typically a problem. Um, <clears throat> because the FS tab, uh, sorry, the mount command will basically try and mount any file systems that are not currently mounted. So what this is basically saying is make sure that this line has been added to that file and then mount everything. So at the end of this boot, we should have um, Ansible installed because of this block here. We should have our um, if we've got any files in etc. Ansible keys, 
we'll get them from there. Um, I don't know why I would have done that though. I'll come back to that one later. Um, and then this block here configures the asset transport file, good stuff. Uh, configures our inventory and then mounts the file system as read and write for users but not for the um, so for the admins but not for the users and then lastly this block here is commented out because I wanted to manually run this command <clears throat> but effectively what this does is it says here's the Ansible playbook we're going to run which again falls in that etc Ansible install directory that we created before and mounted before bindfs um, we're going to limit it to all here's the inventory file that we want to use and then here's the command we actually want to run to execute that. So, why does it say use of in sudo here, when up here, all of these commands are being executed as root? Well, funny story, for some reason, this command here is run as the user, not as the root user. So you have to ask it to run it as sudo. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but there you go. So, this is our Vagrant file. Um, Vagrant has decided to take an inordinate amount of time to install. It's still going, which is all rather disappointing. Um, but then, what have we got over here? Well, over here we have now got our Ansible directory. So, if you have not seen Ansible before, this is a very incredibly simple playbook that says, on this host, admin, um, I will include this role, and this role at the moment is lug.org.uk, so lug.org.uk.bind. So, um, Ansible has this concept of um, the Ansible Galaxy, and Ansible Galaxy is basically anything that is user contributed to Ansible. So, let me uh, fire this up over here and then bring that down here. So. Here is Ansible Galaxy, eventually. <laughs> so in Ansible Galaxy, you have a whole host of roles. So for example, there is a very prolific um, author of um, Ansible modules called uh, Gearling Guy. Um, we don't want collections, we want roles. Where are the roles gone? Authors. Uh, so a role is just a collection of playbooks. Um, the playbook tasks. So again, Gearling Guy, this guy here has produced hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of roles, and they've got all sorts of weird, wonderful things inside them. Um, and essentially, all you do is you run ansible dash galaxy install, and then this command, um, or the, the, the thing that you're trying to put in there. Um, so the naming convention for uh, ansible roles is um, the user dot, and then the function that you want it to perform. Um, what you can also do uh, is, if you've got this Ansible CFG file, is you can say, here is where my roles are. Here is where my collections are, and I'll talk about collections later on if I need to. Um, and then there's some other stuff that I've got in there. But so my roles live in here. So if I pop this roles file out, we've got roles slash log or UK bind. So this then means I can create other roles uh, and stick them into uh, subdirectories up here. So you might have local UK Apache or local UK Mailman or whatever. Um, and that will give you the access to run these actions. So the first thing you'll see in um, these two folders here are main.yaml. They're both called main.yaml. 
Um, and effectively, so what happens first is that these tasks are executed. Um, if you've got a folder called uh, defaults uh, or vars, they are also loaded and they are um, where you define your Ansible variables. Um, but tasks is where you actually execute your commands. So in here, we have got things like with apt, I want you to install bind nine. So make sure that it's present. And that's the name of the package you want to install. Um, I've then said here that I want to install a named.conf.local. Um, <clears throat> so named is what bind calls itself internally for some reason. Um, so stick this file bind named.conf.local. Uh, process the template and stick the output into etc. bind named.conf.local. I'm then going to go through some of these other bits in a second. Um, And then, um, one of the fun things about Bind um, is that it uses what they call a serial. And a serial is just an increment. So what you're supposed to do is each time you touch a file, you increment the, the serial uh, so that the Bind service can then use that to advertise that it's been updated to any, um, they call them um, slaves? Not the best term in it these days, but um, so the the bind piece talks to the slaves, the things that can pull the content down, um, and it can propagate that. So log.org.uk, as I said, we're hosted by Bitfolk. Bitfolk have got their own um, DNS resolver. Um, so what we do is we uh, delegate our um, bind records to them, so they can then uh, ask us for updates, zone transfers, they can ask us for a zone transfer. We'll provide them the details of everything that's in our, bio, in our record and they use that serial number to work out whether that's changed or not. Um, but so because it, we create this serial, um, I've actually written a script here, so this bash script here, which basically just checks whether or not the, the template we've just created um, differs in anything other than the serial number. And if it does, then we need to reload, we need to, it transfers the templated file over the top of the file it's replacing, uh, and then asks bind to reload itself. Fab. Um, we also create um, reverse records. So these are pointers. If you're not aware about how DNS works, um, uh, DNS has a series of record types. So you've got A, uh, which is um, map this address name, this this name label, um, to this IP address. So uh, you might assign example.org to 192.0.2.0, or 192.0.2.1, for example. Um, there's an AA, AA record, uh, which is an IPv6 record. Um, and so that might say something like assign uh, uh, I'm trying to remember what the IPv6 uh, example address is. No, nope, I've, I've lost it. Something like 2db or something like that. Uh, but so 2db colon blah, 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 colon 1, assign that to example.com. So when you hit, the, when you ask for the DNS record for example.com, what you get is um, it'll ask for an AAAA record and an A record. So it asks for the two of them. Depending on how the software is configured, it will typically ask for both. If it only asks for the A record, it'll only get the A record. If it only asks for the AAAA record, it'll only get the AAA record. Um, but typically, it will get one of those two. The next type of record that you'll probably have come across is a C name. Uh, and a C name record basically says, um, don't ask me about anything else. All of my records are pointed at this name. So when you ask, uh, say for example, you're asking um, alias.example.org, that's got a C name that points to uh, example.org. So you ask for alias.example.org, it says C name um, example.org, so you then ask for, you ask example.org for an A record or an AAA record. Um, 
So that's the three main ones that revolve around actually connecting to machines. There are also things like MX records and NS records and pointers and text records and all sorts of fun, funky things like that. You'll see some more of those when we actually start looking at the log.org.uk stuff. Um, but for now, that's probably the bulk of what you'll see with the this block up here. This part down here is a, a reverse record. So instead of saying um, example.org, a record for that is 192.0.2.1. Instead, what you say is um, 1.2.0.2.1. Dot one nine two dot in dot harper. I think that's right. Um, and effectively, what that does is that says who owns this IP address. Um, and it's a pointer record. So what that means is that um, the owner of that pointer record can return and say, "I'm the owner of that record, and these are my text fields." Um, we have got reverse IPv6 bind records for um, the IPv6 addresses in love.org.uk. Um, <clears throat> I'm not hugely sure why we've got them there and not for IPv4, but we haven't got them for IPv4. We've only got them for IPv6, so whatever. Um, so again, we check and make sure that that file hasn't changed for anything other than the serial, and then we reload bind. So this notify reload bind, that is in this handlers thing here. And literally what that does is that asks system D to reload bind nine. Fairly common, fairly standard. Let's have a quick look into the bash script I was talking about. So I mentioned before about how bash scripts have got this prefix line at the top, which tells it that it's a bash script. Um, and again, this is part of the reason why we use that bind FS piece. Um, because that lets us um, remap this as a executable file that we can use. Um, missing source file. Right, so uh, I'm conscious I've been doing this for nearly an hour now. Uh, I know I've not had anyone in to look at my video, but that's, that's fine. It's one of those things. Um, but it's here in case anyone wants to go away and have a look at it. Um, so what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to park this here for now uh, and uh, hopefully by the time I next get one of these streams running, um, which won't be tonight, strangely enough, um, might, be in a, might be in a week, might be in five days, might be in two days, don't know, probably not two days. Um, haven't really decided on the schedule for this yet, uh, but I will start going through some more of the stuff that I've done with this uh, and hopefully... I will have some users who, so some users, some of you guys who are uh, interested in what I'm talking about here, and maybe you will hop on and have a look and uh, tell me some, tell me some things that I'm doing wrong with this stuff. Uh, because part of the reason why I'm looking at doing this is because I have been involved in the streams of some very nice people, uh, notably Lorna Jane Mitchell. Uh, so she is uh, twitch.tv slash Lorna Jane TV, I think. Um, She's uh, consistently talking about open source stuff, usually on a Friday morning in the UK. Um, and she often asks her audience to comment on what she's doing. Uh, so that's part of the reason why I'm doing this as well, because I'd like you to come in and tell me that I'm doing everything wrong, which would be nice. Um, uh, also, Rob, uh, who's Acrobat. Um, I think he's at Acrobatic, but... I'm not sure on that one offhand. Um, so this is here basically because I've been inspired by those two people. I've seen a few other live streams as well that have been interesting to me. Um, but um, yeah, so I'd like you guys to come in and tell me where I'm doing things wrong, how I could be doing things better. I know I've got quite a lot of bash scripting and Ansible stuff in here and you've not even had a look at the uh, templates and stuff that I've written yet. But this is what I do. This is the stuff that I'm interested in. And this is the sort of thing I'd like to show to you guys. So that's me done for now. And I hope you'll have a great rest of your day or your rest of your week or whatever it is time zone you're in. Uh, and I look forward to speaking to you guys again sometime in the near future. 
Thank you very much. He now says not being able to take the stream off. There we go. 